might start and people can join us can, can read the press release. And, and, uh, I'm very glad that, to see members of the press here. Um, we wanted to mark the occasion of new, the government being one year in office by giving our assessment uh, as to how they've done, what they've done right, what they've done wrong. Um, and uh, it's born of, we have exposed experience. They're in a difficult circumstance, the country's in difficult circumstances. We want to share our experience and our assessment of what has worked and what hasn't. Um, and it came seem, first of all, that they need to do three things to get our country working again. We need to get our budget and banking system right. We need to reform our public service and our political system. And maybe more than anything else, we need a vision for the future so that we can stimulate our economy and give ourselves a sense of common purpose again. The key decision made by the new government was made by its first day in office when it was decided that Fine Gael, rather than Labour, would hold the finance brief. All the political posturing from the Labour Party in opposition on the economy was abandoned straight away as Eamon Gilmer decided that what he had described as treason was now his new reason. The government has largely adopted the banking and budgetary policy that was set in place by the previous government. And it would be wrong for us not to acknowledge the successes that they've had in that regard and to give them room for manoeuvre when they've any setbacks in implementing that plan. And if I can't say we're at a particularly sensitive time at the moment, reading the papers today, reading what we're hearing from the European Central Bank, seeing the negotiations that are going on, we need to get that right. We've been trying to play our part. We've been going to our colleagues in Brussels and Berlin and saying, supporting our government, that we need to get some space from our European colleagues. It's a shocking situation we said to our colleagues in Berlin two weeks ago that it is the IMF who's been more progressive in our dealings with them than the European institutions. So we support our government and we look, to get, look for them to get real success in the coming weeks and months uh, on that budget and banking issue to help our country out of the crisis, where, uh, which we need to do. But to, we can give that support on the one hand, and at the same time, hold both parties to account for what we see as the real failures of this government in promoting fairness, in bringing any real reform, in having any sense of economic stimulus to get us out of the deflationary cycle that we're in. They weren't fair when they dipped into people's personal pensions the way they did. It wasn't fair that the poor were hit hardest in the last budget because both parties had to keep their promises of not raising taxes and not cutting pay. I'm glad one measure that's uh, progressing in political form, the gender balance we're going to have at the next election, which was an initiative that we introduced in government, that the government is progressing with that. But other than that, I think their record in political reform has been abysmal. They ran an arrogant and dangerous referendum campaign, which the public, in their wisdom, threw back at them, the one in the Oireachtas inquiries. The only political reform that Phil Hogan seems to understand is bringing power back into the Custom House, where he holds the purse and he pulls all the, all the, the uh, strings. That's not the political reform that we need. But their biggest failing, in my mind, is that they haven't actually been able to stimulate or their own vision as how to stimulate the economy. The Troika rightly criticised them for putting excessive cuts in the capital budget ahead of cuts in the current side. It's the traditional hands of the Department of Finance and Fine Gael that are in charge, and the Labour Party seems to have lost its way. They've forgotten everything that John Maynard Keynes taught them about how you, what you actually need to do in the middle of a crisis. And every time they're asked a hard, hard question, they throw their hands up and say, we don't have the money, it's not our fault, it's the previous Shah did it. But they did have a choice, not to abandon the public transport projects, but instead go looking for Euro project bonds, or Euro, the, uh, the uh, connecting Euro facilities that are becoming available to pay for those projects. They had a choice not to abandon ESB and board gash, and instead use those companies' capability to raise money on the commercial bond markets to get a green economist, uh, economic stimulus happening again. They had a chance. They ditched their strategic investment bank straight away, as if they didn't believe the Labour Party, their own promises that they put in place before the election. So it's in that area, I think, that the greatest criticism, the failure of vision to actually create new opportunities, new economic opportunities and new stimulus, is what we will hold them for account in the coming year.
Margaret. Um, the, uh, the midterm fiscal review um, is very clear about the need to raise additional revenues between now and 2015, but 4.5 billion growth perhaps may account for a billion of that. So we need to find uh, 3.5 billion in, in, in additional uh, taxation measures, a huge challenge. Um, and one that I think this government already looks like it's going to flunk if you look at the very, very crude mechanism that is the household charge, designed to raise roughly two billion, um, but without any, uh, any thought given to how it might be implemented and resulting obviously in a huge level of resistance among those like myself who will pay but who uh, resent the, the nature and the design of the scheme. There is a massive opportunity here and the times that are in it um, provide that opportunity for us to have a fair system that finally starts to uh, deal with the whole question of residential or property or, or, or uh, tax. And it's, it's, it's a site valuation system, one that, um, uh, that imposes uh, a tax on the, on the unapproved value of sites uh, of every residential and commercial property in the country. Depending on how it's pitched, it can raise additional revenue, it can replace uh, existing taxes, and I think it's important to say that, 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 that a system like this is not simply about adding to the take, but about replacing taxes that are holding the economy back, Con taxes that affect consumption like VAT, taxes that affect jobs like income tax. They can be eased back sh should a site valuation tax be properly designed and implemented between now and 2015. I don't see any evidence at this stage that the government are thinking in a way in which they can impose taxation measures and at the same time free up the productive economy and create the jobs that they wish to create, they say. Um, their claim around fairness is also open to question, huge question. Um, the decision, as Eamon already mentioned, the pact, if you like, not to touch welfare or, or income tax, has meant that regressive taxes were introduced and that the cutbacks, the 475 million cutbacks that social welfare imposed, over 300 million of them were on direct income provision for poorer families. Um, such as uh, the reduction in child benefits to families with three or more children, the amounts payable under rent, rent uh, the rent supplement scheme, and so on. And it has meant that the lowest earners in the country, for the first time in five budgets, are being more heavily affected than the top earners. Even at a time when the last government was introducing the huge cuts, and this was a point that was made by Brian Downing on uh, 6-1 uh, on, on drive time the other evening, 70% of the heavy lifting in terms of the fiscal adjustments were done, uh, and, and, and the public deficit were done by the last government. This, this government, of course, is claiming the, the credit and the benefit for a lot of that heavy lifting. But it was, in fact, done by the previous administration with some very, very tough budgets, there's no question, but budgets that kept an eye on equity and progressiveness. And that was in large part due to the, the Green Party voice in the formulation of those budgets. I know, because I was involved in, in the very last of them, that an, the eye was never taken off the principle of equality and equity uh, in, the, in, the, in the development and delivery of those budgets, which were, as the, as the stats from the SRI and others prove, progressive in nature, all of them. Uh, the first regressive one, as I say, in five years was a budget that was uh, sponsored by Fine Gael and designed by Fine Gael and Labour, uh, extraordinarily, given their claims today that they're delivering fairness. And in fact, uh, the opposite is the case. That it was a deeply unfair budget. It is a time to return to progressive budgeting. Thank you, Mark. Marianne Butler, our enterprise spokesperson, can I ask you? Um, the continuing stream of foreign direct investment is keeping our country afloat, um, but it's a longer term trend and it's not due to any measures introduced um, in the last year by the current government. Um, we need a government that understands new technologies, new markets, um, but we have senior ministers who cut their teeth in the days of analogue. They talk about prospects about cloud computing, but they sign us up to damaging SOPA legislation. They talk about new jobs in the IFSC, but they are slow to advance the Digital Rights Centre and the Green IFSC projects, which are sitting up for them, ready to go. They talk about the green economy, but they have cut supports for ocean energy, for microgeneration, and for electric vehicle networks. The American and Chinese governments are going for growth in these areas, but our government is pulling away from them heeding the advice of the Department of Finance, which does not believe in digital and which does not believe in green. And lastly, if I can ask Kieran Cuff, our public enterprise spokesperson. Thanks, Eamon. The one area where the Labour Party is in control is in the management of our public uh, service. 
But I have to ask, what real reform has, have we seen in the last year? The response to the crisis seems to have been cuts across the board rather than prioritising uh, spending in some areas and changing work practices in others to make the same overall saving. Such an approach might uh, encounter greater resistance from a particular vested interest or interest, but it's a time for taking courageous decisions. If the government can explain and justify why they're doing it, I think they'll certainly get opposition support, including our own. It's time to move on from the Croke Park Agreement. The Public Service Agreement 2010 to 2014 was a cautious document that failed to grasp the nettle of institutional reform. Rather than relying exclusively on a voluntary redundancy scheme, why didn't they tell the small number of people who weren't able to do their jobs that they would have to be amongst the ones to go? Public servants must be promoted on merit, not seniority. Performance must be better measured, competence rewarded, and underperformance penalised. Michael Bloomberg, the Mayor of New York, said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. I'm not convinced that we're measuring what needs to be recorded in the public service. Mandatory redundancy is better for the state, better for the taxpayer, and better for the individual. And the culture of mediocrity in some ends of our public services has to go. Automatic pay increments must also be considered, and root and branch reform of productivity and performance in the public sector is now required. It doesn't automatically follow that somebody's better at doing their job if they've been doing it for 15 years, and I suspect that in some instances the reverse is true. We need innovation, new ideas, and out-of-the-box thinking. And that can be difficult if you've been working from the same cubicle for a decade or more. But I'm delighted that the new Secretary General in Finance ran juice bars in the south of France, and we need more of that kind of background and experience. And why does it still take an age to move people across departments and agencies to shore up the critical areas where we need them most? There needs to be greater horizontal movement of staff between government departments and between the civil service and other state agencies. It is a hard time to be in government, but it's also a good time to be a minister. You have a unique chance to show that you can manage your department well, using limited resources to still achieve great effect. I don't know what the Taoiseach's ministerial scorecard looks like, but at the end of the first year, I'm not sure that any one of them can be given an honours grade. Thank you. Okay, if we can turn open for questions. After seeing the, um, the spat, the embarrassing spat yesterday between both coalition partners over the protocol cancelled, and does that remind you of your time? And what advice would you give to? <laughs> yes, it does. I mean, the latter part in our time in government, it, it was. Uh, we lost public confidence partly because of those spats. It does people at this crisis time, they don't want that. You know, I, they want to have a sense of people in control, working together. They, they don't want a government that's round to each other in public. Um, that's one of the lessons I would have learned from my time in government, is get on with the... I met Nick Clegg, the UK Liberal government minister. He said there's a real different dilemma in any coalition government, where your partial people don't want you to get on with the other guys, because you're naturally not colleagues. You're the naturally, maybe they're the enemy. But actually, for the good of the run the country, you've got to get on. And that's a difficult dilemma. In general, I think in this particular crisis time, it's a time to get on with people, to work collectively, and not to be engaged in silly public spats uh, that has happened in the last two days. Uh, Eamon, you say that it wasn't fair that the poor were hit so hard by the current government. What was fair about your government's minimum? The, well, the government wave cut did not go ahead. It was introduced, it was pushed by the Troika at the time as a key element in their package. It was one of the things that we did, we were very uncomfortable about. The, the, you know, I, I'm trying to recall whether it was actually fully agreed. It wasn't a deal. Um, that was one of the su successes in, of, of this new government. They managed to reverse that and I would accept it. Some people would argue that it may be holding back employment. There are two different views on that. My personal view is that I prefer to have the minimum wage because I think for those people in working class communities it's difficult enough to kind of create the environment, create the incentive to get out and work. I think having a minimum wage some, somewhat does that. So I'd acknowledge, I'd say fair enough, they managed to change that. 
Um, but I think they need to get a hell of a lot more. And I think particularly at this time, the real issue is how they're going to negotiate with the ECB. And, well, you don't negotiate directly with the ECB, but how are they going to negotiate with the, with the European in institutions for us to get some sort of flexibility on our debt arrangements? I think that is the big issue now that we have to look at. Um, and as I said, that's something where we're trying to make a con con contribution, any contribution that we can make, through our, our close connections with our European colleagues, in Germany and France particularly. There's a lot of um, emphasis on the Labour Party in the press release, uh, almost to the exclusion of Fine Gael. And people who are cynical might say that you're just having a go at the Labour Party because that's where your full potential lies in the local elections in 2014 and subsequent general election in 2016. No, our vote comes from a variety of different locations and we'll, we'll look forward to, take, to welcoming Fine Gael voters just as much as, as Labour. The reason we did concentrate on that is because, as I said, the biggest failing of this government is the failure to provide any new economic stimulus. And the Labour Party, if there was one party you would have thought would implement a Keynesian counter-cyclical investment programme, would be the Labour Party. They have failed that miserably. As I said, they are implementing the budget and banking plan that we were party to. And, and we would accept and acknowledge both parties in terms of having to do that. Having the Labour Party haven't completely gone back on what they said the previous three years. Fair enough. We expected more from Labour. We, we weren't altogether surprised at Fine Gael uh, in some aspects of government. But we expected more and they promised more. But you weren't in a position to provide stimulus towards the end of your... I mean, even before they... they, they the Troika came knocking at the door of government. E even before that, there was there was a, a question mark over stimulus. The, the budgets in the run of the two budgets in the run up to that provided no stimulus at all. Both of them were austerity budgets. But if you look, you did say that you tried to bring fairness into them, but there was there was very little left in terms of investment or in terms of providing stimulus. If you look at the last year, our, our last year in government, the ESB and the board gash were raising hundreds of millions on the commercial bond markets had a massive expansionary stimulus programme. We had a €4 billion Euro transmission grid project in train. We had a €25 billion ESB investment plan in train and financed on the international commercial bond markets. We had Board Gash investing and able to raise money in the international commercial bond markets. The decision to go away from that funding route outside the exchequer, doesn't sit on the, on the exchequer, on the exchequer uh, accounts, but actually provides a real stimulus in the country, is one of the real failings of this government in the last year. We held a line on the likes of the Metro project, kept it in there, it was included in the Troika agreed four year plan. We had the budget for those public transport projects, they abandoned it. That's a social project, that's a, the right environment, or that's the right economic investment at this time. Anyone with a Keynesian understanding say, yeah, they're the sort of projects you build in the middle of the severe deflationary downturn cycle. That is traditional Labour Party thinking, and they've abandoned it. They have lost their way. That's why we're so critical of them here today. Some uh, of the opponents of the fiscal compact treaty, including uh, people in the trade union movement, have said that the, the treaty attempts to outlaw I've said that um, we've yet to make a decision as a party. We have to do our rules. We go to a convention and, and the members who need a two-thirds majority for us to take a position in a referendum. We don't know yet when the government is even going to hold the referendum, so we'll have to wait until we know that as to when we hold a, a, a convention. I've said that I actually am supportive of us voting for the treaty. Uh, I think for all my criticisms of the European institutions, and they are real, as I said, I think the, both the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the German and French governments in particular have badly got it wrong, have actually taken the wrong course in terms of economic strategy. Despite that, or even having taken that into account, I believe our country's future is better placed within Europe and within the Euro area than it is without. I actually look forward to the referendum because I think, can we at least get some honesty from Sinn Féin to say that their alternative strategy would inevitably put us back into the sterling area and an effective union with the United Kingdom. Is that what they want for the Irish people? I don't think 
That's our better long-term future. I think our better long-term future is maintaining our central position within the Union. And that's why I'll be supporting and voting myself for the Fiscal Compact Treaty. It does allow, I went to listen to Professor Philip Lane, uh, Trinity Professor of Macroeconomics. His analysis is that there is flexibility within the Fiscal Compact to allow for the sort of Keynesian adjustment that I'm talking about. That it's not saying you have to have a complete uh, bar on any attempt to provide counter-cyclical investment opportunities. So I, on that basis, on the basis of his analysis, I think it is possible for us to, to provide that Keynesian solutions and at the same time support the fiscal compact. So when the government sets a date, you will call a conference and you will personally ask the conference to support the, to allow the party to campaign? Yeah, we've already had a very healthy internal debate uh, in our European policy group where we've been looking at this up, inside out, upside down. But uh, that will be my personal position. It will be up for the party to, to decide. Okay, there's no other questions. If there's any uh, questions, we will be with that. I very much appreciate people coming along and uh, look forward to, to similar events in the future. Thank you. Thank you.